Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Life Technology, for inviting me. Uh, he stole my joke, actually. I arrived yesterday, and I'm very sleepy. So, <laughs> by my watch, it's around 6.30 p.m. By my body, it's about 1 a.m. I'll try to be as fast as possible and still convey meaningful information to you. So, um, what we do today, with what, what we're talking today, is about the use of digital PCR Quant Studio 3D system to measure HER2 in borderline amplified breast cancer samples. So a brief introdu introduction about HER2 or HERBB2 as the official nomenclature goes. So as most of you know, uh, HER2 is amplified in up to 15, 20% of breast cancer patients this leads, in turn, to uh, overexpression of ER2 and to an aberrant proliferation and a worse prognosis. Since there are targeted therapies that are mainly antibodies against ER2, and now there are also new antibodies targeting the binding of ER2 to ER3, it is of the utmost importance to identify those patients that actually have HER2 amplification in order to make a proper decision for their treatment. So here's just an example by a RACGH on a cell line that we used as a positive control. Um, a RACGH shows a high level amplification of the ERBB2 locus. So, as I was mentioning again, ER2 is focal in breast cancer. It is part of the herb family of um, membrane tyrosine kinases. So, upon amplification, ER2 is overexpressed. Overexpression leads, goes to protein overexpression, and protein overexpression in itself is sufficient to drive breast cancer cell proliferation because HER2 homodimerizes or heterodimerizes with other members of the family and activates a plethora of downstream targets which are in themselves now targeted by targeted therapies. So this is a very important pathway. Examples are PI3 kinase, mTOR, BRAF, and KIRAS, which is upstream, and SARC. So there is an issue in ER2 status determination, which is basically that you have to identify the amplification. So uh, ASCO and the College and the College of American Physicians Pathologists identified a um, level of tests to be performed in uh, breast cancer to identify those patients. So basically, the first line is immunist chemistry, and there are scores which go from zero to three plus. Three plus being highly positive and no doubt about it, treated, uh, the tumor I mean. Uh, zero is negative, one plus is negative, two plus is equivocal. It means non-uniform or we complete greater than 10% but smaller than 30% cells are stained for HER2 antibody. So what shall we do then? Proceed to a second level test like fluorescence and cytohybridization. So this can be done by either single color fish or dual color fish. Single color fish is uh, basically you take a big fish probe, uh, 100 kilobases or something like, targeting HER2 locus, and you count the number of HER2 foci in each nucleus in a number of nuclei ranging from a minimal of 20 to up to whatever you want to be sure that there is actually an amplification or there is no amplification. Or you can take two probes, one in the centromeric region and one on the HER2 locus and perform a ratio. So if the ratio is below a certain threshold, you have a negative sample. Same goes for the absolute average count. If the average count is above six, which was chosen as a cutoff, you have an amplified breast cancer. Uh, again, 
you get equivocal results. Uh, in the clinical community, we don't treat these cancers with uh, anti-HER2 drugs. So we're not still sure that it's beneficial, actually. So this specific kind of breast cancer, the borderline amplified or equivocal, is really interesting because we would like to stratify them for being sure that actually they are amenable to be treated or not. Why are they equivocal? As I mentioned, one reason is that cutoff is uh, somehow arbitrary. You, you must have a cutoff and whatever comes below or above is in a gray area. Also, you have technical, material, and operator-related biases, like, for example, your paraffin embedded material is no good, um, or other stuff like that. And then low-level amplification of herb 2 can occur, and we're not sure about the effect. Oftentimes, you may have what's the pathologist still somehow refer to as polysomic HER2 uh, breast cancer. This is improper because it has been widely demonstrated by the RSEGH actually it's due to centromeric amplification. Real chromosome 17 polysomy is extremely, extremely rare. Uh, I'll still call them polysomic for the sake of simplicity. Also, there is a problem of heterogeneity, so fish basically is a microscopy-based technique. It can be automated, uh, but still looks at a number of nuclei, and if the region that is looked upon is not the right one, you may miss the amplification. So another issue concerning breast cancer is the real proximity of top to alpha to RB2. Top to alpha is the target for anthracyclines, which are one of the mainstays of breast cancer treatment. So there is a whole body of literature uh, arguing that either top to alpha um, co-amplification is important or is it, it is not for breast cancer treatment. We wanted to assess it, but what we are sure of is that top to alpha usually gets lower level amplification if it is amplified at all. So there are several other ways to assess her to Quantitative PCR is cheap, precise, reproducibles is a good technique. We use them. RICGH, RICGH is okay. I mean, um, as long as you have a good operator, good data analyzer, uh, a good facility, you're sure that the sample is good quality and all this stuff. So, and it's not that cheap. So, um, it's not cannot be considered, although very interesting in terms of research, probably it cannot be considered an alternative to fish. And digital PCR. So digital PCR is this new guy. This actually, it is here, they put it. So the digital PCR Quant Studio 3D is basically a very small device. It's a 20,000 micro well chip. You have a very easy um, workflow. You mix in your primers, same as for quantitative PCR. You load the chip, you amplify, and then you read it. And by the number of spots that gets lightened up, you can perform a Poisson regression and understand the absolute copy number per microliter of the genes you're studying. So this is simple. This is quite affordable, and moreover, this is absolute. It does not require normal calibrator or stuff like that. And so you get an exact number. So we were, wow, it's very interesting. This may be really, really a, an alternative to what we have. So the present study, which is a very small study, it's a pilot study, we just started with the worst possible samples ever high heterogeneity, equivocal, borderline breast cancers, and we assess them by fish. I will present you the single color fish data, digital PCI, PCR, and the RICGH. And also we did that 
for both ER2 and TOP2 alpha and correlated the expression values of these two genes with the data we got from the copy numbers. So we analyzed four breast cancers, some negative, some positive, 26 breast cancer uh, samples, most of them, as I told you, equivocal, a uh, couple of them negative or positive controls, and real, real difficult samples. Paraffin embedded, uh, macro dissected or micro dissected if cellularity was smaller than 70%, quantitated, and for, in case we use also qPCR, we used a pool of DNA extracted from healthy donors, uh, peripheral blood samples. For gene expression, use median over the entire array. And uh, for array CGH, we use commercially available GDNA. So I will skip through these details. What is important really is that the input of the digital PCR performed with Quant Studio is probably inflated. I talked with um, Trish Egerich, who actually performed this, the experiment. Uh, it's really the beginning of this device, so she wanted to be sure and probably use more material than needed. Uh, she thinks that it might go down to 20 nanograms to determine appropriately the copy number. And uh, array CGH were performed with, uh, by Agilent 8x60K and uh, QRT-PCR and QPCR, as you see there, were Tuckman probes for QRT-PCR, okay? So this is the usual slide that nobody looks at. I'm sorry I put it in the end of the day. I realize it's awful. Uh, it's just the samples, the negative, positive, copy number for the techniques. And actually, you get a nice line, a nice column, which is the absolute copies per microliter performed by digital PCR. This is sort of cute. So you get at the absolute copy number. You have to ratio it with an internal reference, of course, which is a gene we chose because other authors found that it is rarely amplified or deleted in breast cancer. It's called APP, the amyloid precursor protein. It's called chromosome 21. Um, but then you didn't have to use a calibrator, so it's an absolute quantification, actually. You do it in a duplex upon the same chip. Um, so another consideration must be done before showing you the results is that copy number is really not as variable as gene expression is. For the same transcript, you may have a hundredfold variation. For copy number, if you're lucky, you have something like the array CGH from the sample, which was a breast cancer cell, and I showed you, so like 20 copies. But it's rare to go up to that level. You usually have a very small range of variation. And of course, there are limitations. Double uh, dual color fish has limitation in that the centromeric region can be amplified, and uh, digital PCR, how we performed it with uh, the APP reference, may have limitation because, for example, you see that on chromosome 21, on one sample, we have a hypodipoid region. So it might turn out that actually HER2 was overestimated. Let's take a look at the data finally. So, um, <coughs> x axis, you have fish for the uh, first two plots, y-axis you have uh, digital PCR. So you see that there is a trend for significance in uh, um, digital PCR versus single color fish. Uh, there is actually almost no trend between array CGH and fish, but there is a very significant correlation between array CGH and digital PCR. This is meaningful because these are unbiased techniques that take just a mix of DNA you have that may contain heterogeneous cells, and then you measure them. There's no operator-dependent bias in these specific elements. Some sample actually shows up, show up at outliers, um, and as I told you, it might be because there was hypodiploid copy number for the reference genes in digital PCR. And of course, if you want to do something very flawed statistically, you include the real positives. So you see that Pearson's correlation here goes up to 0 0.98. It's a joke, of course. We miss the data in between. So we still have to have a broader set of samples to understand if across the variability of her two copy number, we have a reproducible um, measurement of 
the data. So top two alpha also shows a good correlation between digital PCR and array CGH. And finally, to bore you a little bit more, uh, no correlation between different methodologies would be cool without a blunt Altman plot. What it is, basically, you plot the mean of the two measures for the same point by the difference, and you hope that everything sticks into an horizontal line, that your regression is horizontal, so it will mean that across a huge variability, uh, the two methodologies are almost the same. Of course, it's not the case for our data set, but why? Too few samples, a small region of variability, <laughs> systematic biases. See the upper left plot is digital PCR, Lower left is the array CGH. The array CGH tend to compress the more you get amplified. So there is a very significant regression line toward being uh, negatively correlating. As higher the HER2 value goes, the lower array CGH performs compared to fish. But still, I think that if we increase the number of points, especially between fish and digital PCR, we might get very interesting results, such as those, and I'll show you something. So, okay, first of all, top two alpha, copy number, and gene expression do not correlate. This is completely expected. Copy number of top two alpha does not drive its expression unless it's hugely amplified, and it's almost never. So this was like an internal negative control. Her2 does, her2 does, of course. There are two outliers, and very funny, because we ran QPCR, Array CGH, Quant Studio, Gene Expression, a negative, a positive, and they all agree, but for these two samples, I don't know why, um, a friend of mine back in Brussels really suggested that we cut the wrong area or we might be back at the blocks and see what happens because there, fish and gene expression agree, but the other techniques do not. So I really think that fish the pathologists that perform fish picked up a different region than the one we analyzed. If you take off those two outliers, gene expression and digital PCR by Quant Studio actually tend to make a good bland Altman plot, considering that there is a very small variability in this data set, and the data set is small as well. So since what we want to see is protein, and gene expression is a, a proxy for protein, and copy number is a proxy for gene expression, it really means that we are having some real biological data to me to see that actually copy number and gene expression for HER2 are in such a good correlation on such a difficult data set on so few samples. So it is really intriguing and excited me a lot to see this data. So in conclusion, I think that the data we got from the collaboration with Light Technology on the Quant Studio 3D uh, shows, that, shows that it's a highly precise method, very precise, for copy number variation assessment. Uh, it performs well on paraffin embedded sample because that's what we used. It has good correlation with RICGH, which is food for thoughts. I won't comment on that because I don't have time, but it un highlights the difference, the intrinsic difference between uh, fish which is microscopy-based and molecular biology assays, has a fair degree of concordance with fish, and the best part of it is independent of a calibrator or a control sample which you might want to use for traditional quantitative PCR. So I think it's a very promising system with a great outlook for upcoming improvements. And I want to end up by thanking all the guys in uh, my laboratory uh, from left to the right, all the biologists and the data managers, and uh, um, Trish Agaric from Life Technologies, and David Norman Brown, who is a bioinformatician working at the Jules Bordet, that suggested me some weird plots that I implemented in this presentation. And with this, thank you. And I'll take any questions if there are any.